This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. So when Ken asked me to come up and speak, um, when we kind of first booked it, the first thing I did is I started growing my hair as a way to one-up him. <laughs> so I've, Ken's a pretty tough guy to one-up. I always joke and call him the world's most interesting man, so I figured at least I could grow some hair out. So um, he actually gave me a great bio. Like he said, I grew up in Southern California, went to this, what I like to call a small, very conservative school up in Northern California. <laughs> known as UC Berkeley. Um, like I said, I, I got a football scholarship. I had something like uh, 106 scholarship offers coming out of high school. So I was pretty highly recruited and uh, chose to go to Berkeley. Um, merely for the fact that uh, I remember years ago, my mom and dad talking about Berkeley being a place that a lot of smart people get to go to. And so the valedict uh, valedictorian in my high school didn't get to go there. So I figured <laughs> this would be a good opportunity and I got to go. So surprising when I got there, I realized uh, it was a lot of hype. Um, just like everything, you know, if you get into a situation uh, that you tend to really flourish, and for me, college was great. Um, I, I got to read, I got to write, and I got to be around a lot of smart people, and that helped me think. And I graduated in four years and went on and did my master's work in education. Uh, student taught in the Oakland Public School District and also at Berkeley, and then realized that I wanted an easier job, so I went to go play in the NFL. <laughs> Very tough. Uh, like he said, I came in the NFL uh, as a young guy. I walked in, you know, far down on the depth chart, and by the end of that mini camp, I was the starter and went in and proceeded to start for most of my NFL career. So, actually, all my NFL career. Uh, very interesting in that, uh, like he said, um, I don't really have a science background. I was an English philosophy major as a rhetoric major and had an education degree. But the thing that was good is it, it gave me an idea to evaluate things and, more importantly, how to be a critical thinker. And as an NFL player, I had one singular goal. I never cared about the money, um, even though it was nice. I never cared about the fame, the riches, the cars, the suits, and any of the bullshit that you guys see on TV. Uh, I had one singular goal, which was I wanted to go out and just basically try to beat somebody's ass for three hours every Sunday <laughs> in front of millions of people. So uh, guys talk about, you know, I'm gonna go out and make a difference in this, and I'm like, I'm not out here curing cancer. I'm basically pushing around other guys in white spandex. And uh, I don't make any illusions about what I did, but they just pay me an exorbitant amount of money to basically beat wholesale ass. So I, uh, I looked at it from that perspective, and uh, as a young kid, I grew up, I, I did martial arts, and then I thought kicking was dumb, so I got into boxing. Had two older brothers, and I always enjoyed the combat sports. So for me, uh, you know, there hasn't been a great white hope in a number of years since like Rocky Marciano, so I figured, you know, football was probably an easier way to go. So. Like I said, I got to go play in the NFL, and I had a, an excellent opportunity to go out and train with the world's best. And I was kind of, I don't know if it was annoying or good or bad, but I always ask questions. How does this work? Why is this working? Why are we doing this? And I'm kind of the conscientious objector. I'm like, I'm not disagreeing with any of this stuff. I'm going to do it. But just give me some background and some information for me to be able to make an educated decision so I can go out and effectively do something better. Uh, a lot of guys I, I used to joke were like mushrooms. Put them in the closet and feed them shit you know, put them in the dark. I, I wanted to know all the information. And so in the NFL, um, as you guys might know or might not know, they really don't like guys that ask questions. Just show up, beat your head in, when you're done with that, go home and don't ask any questions, and I wasn't that guy. So, long story short, I retired from the NFL in 2009, and like he said, about two or three weeks before training camp to go play for the Philadelphia, or so for the uh, New England Patriots, I got a phone call from this little kind of micro gym called CrossFit and asked if I would come compete in their annual CrossFit Games. At the time, I weighed about 312 pounds, and I thought to myself, sure, I'll go win this thing. <laughs> so I went up to Aromas, California and competed in the CrossFit Games, finished out of 200 in the 70s, I think. Uh, needless to say, I was at a slight disadvantage. And then about six days later, I went to go play for the New England Patriots. I ended up getting hurt at that end of the season, and I came home, had knee surgery, and while I was rehabbing, it's when CrossFit hit me up about teaching performance. And as I sat on the phone, and they suggested the name of CrossFit Football, which was a terrible name, and I remember being telling them, I don't think this is a good name. People aren't going to get it. They think there's going to be block blocking and tackling. And they were like, they're going to get it. And even Ken made a joke they didn't get it. So <laughs> the seminar was really about how to influence strength and conditioning from a grassroots level. Uh, CrossFit has done more in terms of physical preparation and done more for performance training than any other person on the planet at this point in terms of building gyms, getting barbells in people's hands, and whether or not you disagree with the training style, what they've done is they've opened people up to this idea of fitness. And a big part of my talk is going to be the idea of performance fitness. And even though it's labeled for aging populations, this is thing that's universally acceptable. 
So we work with athletes of all ages. Like I said, I was just out working with the guys at the um, Army down in Fort Bragg, and we deal with Navy SEALs and high-level performers on all different levels from professional sports. And one thing is universally true as I go through this. So my first slide. We get old because we stop training. We don't stop training because we get old. So the guy on the top uh, right, or on your left rather, is a guy named Freddy Camacho. Freddy's 54 years old, pretty good shape. Um, trains, still competes in the CrossFit Games. At one at that year in 2008, he was the sixth fittest in the country, or six, six fittest in the world for the CrossFitters. Uh, we've worked with him for a number of years and had to design training styles that allow for him to grow and really kind of mature into who he was. Um, obviously, you see, uh, that's actually my home gym. So it's fitness is something we take very, very seriously at my house, and so much so that that is actually, <laughs> that is, a, that is actually a picture of my home gym. Uh, down on the left-hand corner. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing by the laughter that uh, I'm gonna get a show of hands. How many people have exercise equipment in their house that they use as a uh, mock clothing <laughs> deal? It's okay, everybody has it. My mom and dad have it. They still have this bow flex that my mom swears hangs laundry better than anything else. <laughs> and then this other guy who's just sitting there who, you know, Long hair, misshaven, just sitting there on the TV. And unfortunately, that is our reality on the bottom. What is top is not necessarily our reality and really looks like is the outliers, the weirdos, the mutants, the people that, oh, it's, it, for some reason, they were gifted. And here's the deal, nobody is. Uh, people just have different opportunities in life. Um, the secret to athletic performance and athletic success is based off of three things. Genetics, geography, and opportunity. So you think about if I want to be a hammer thrower, for example, and compete in the Olympics, and I don't grow up in Iceland, there's a good chance, or Finland, uh, one of the Nordic countries, that I've probably never been exposed. How many people over here have ever thrown the hammer? How many people have ever seen the hammer thrown? <laughs> right? So, okay, well, we got one, right? So the world's best hammer throwers come from Finland. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you, I broke my thumb the other day, too. Uh, but that type of opportunity, so the genetics, you know, does somebody in my family throw the hammer? Do I have any opportunity to throw it? Uh, you know, is it something that's important around me? And more importantly, do I have the desire and the opportunity to do these things? Uh, professional athletes and the people that you see compete at the highest level from the Olympics aren't there by accident. They're there because they have a certain aptitude and they've had an opportunity to do this. Very few people just naturally show up to something and are good at it. And the, the part of this talk we get into is going to be based off of that. So, fitness versus athleticism. This is kind of the age-old debate. And if I were to ask you guys about fitness and what fitness meant, every one of you would give me a different answer. Do you think there's a universal application or a universal definition of fitness? No, there's not. What about athleticism? Do you think we could all pretty much, within a standard deviation of one or two, agree within this room about who's a great athlete and who has incredible athleticism? Yeah. And why is that? Because fitness is not very visual in a lot of ways. If you see somebody that's real lean and in good shape, you assume they're fit, but you know nothing about their capacity to do anything. If I, uh, a great example, I, I live in Texas now. I grew up in Southern California, and about a year ago, we moved out to 16 acres outside of Austin. I uh, realized I didn't want to live in California anymore. Uh, I didn't want to live in Orange County. I didn't want to live that life. I wanted my kids to have a better existence. So we sold everything, and we bought a bunch of acreage in Texas, and we live on a ranch now and my kids go out and we work. Uh, my, one of the guys who works for me, we had to dig fence poles. So we were digging a bunch of fence posts, putting it up, and after about three holes, we were smoked. <laughs> so my neighbor comes down, who's uh, in his late 50s, and he brings uh, a couple of the guys, and he has an excavating business, has been doing dirt work his whole life. Brings down a couple of the guys that work for him, some older Mexican guys, uh, gentlemen that were in their 50s, and they're all fairly you know, mid-50s, out of shape guys that probably drink too many beer and eat too much. And I watched these older men whoop our ass in terms of digging holes. <laughs> they, they must have dug 20 holes in what it took us three, three holes to dig. Now, why is that? These guys got 40 years behind a shovel. They, they're fit for what they're doing. They understand technique, movement. They're efficient. They're not just smashing at the deal. And it started kind of giving me an idea about, you know, fitness is personal thing. Like, what do you need it for? But athleticism is something very, very different in that it's, uh, it's symmetry, it's beauty. You guys can turn on the NFL, you can turn on uh, the Olympics, and you can watch some of the finest athletic achievements on the planet, and everybody is pretty much in awe. 
So if that means that if everybody agrees, and it doesn't matter where you come from, if everybody agrees on the same thing, then there has to be some universal truths. So we'll start with what is fitness. Uh, fitness, like I said, has many, many different definitions. Every sports scientist on the planet has defined fitness. Now, I'll click through this one. So the first definition, biological fitness, means the ability to survive and re to reproductive age, find a mate, and produce offspring. Basically, the more offspring an organism produces during its lifetime, the greater its biological fitness. So, <laughs> I have three kids. <laughs> Does anybody here and have four kids? <laughs> Who's got five? Oh, we got one with five? Any six? You got six? No, six? Okay, so he's the fittest guy on the planet, right, for us. <laughs> I mean, but you think about that's a biological definition, right? If you think about why we're on this planet, and I'm not going to get into some religious debate in this, and you know, you have uh, you know religion and and you know evolution on that deal. But at the end of the at the end of the planet, I mean, you think about the only impact that I have is the ripple I make on other people. So if I leave my offspring, uh, you know, and they go on and they do something great, then that effectively is extending my bloodline, and really why we're here in terms of biological fitness. So, the standard Webster's Dictionary of fitness, the quality of being suitable to fulfill a particular role or task. Mm -hmm. So what is that? That's really the definition of useful. Mm -hmm. So fitness is about being useful. So am I, uh, have I defined it, but how many of you guys sit back and look and say, all right, what do I need to do in my life? My fitness might look different than what it did when I was 23 years old, but I've reevaluated because it's a flexible deal. But I think where people make a mistake is they don't reverse engineer. They don't sit and say, hey, what do I need to be fit for? Do I need to be fit to live? Do I want to go play 18 rounds of golf? Do I want to be able to go run those 18 holes of golf? What if my car breaks down, can I, or uh, the golf cart breaks down, can I push it back to the clubhouse? What do you need it for? And have you prepared in such a way that allows you to meet these demands? That's what always happens to us, and you see it all the time recently in Texas with, uh, with a lot of the flooding. People weren't prepared, so what do they do when they, when they don't prepare? They panic, right? And then they make terrible decisions, and they put themselves in danger, and they put those and love them around in danger. So what I really look at is that if you understand what's ahead of you, then you should be constantly preparing for it. You know, and we can go back uh, a bunch of years ago and say, you know, what with the Boy Scouts, which, you know, it's nearly as popular as it used to be, but it was, you know, be prepared, you know, have the skills that you can to be able to help you succeed farther down. And that seems to be something that we've kind of lost a little bit of sight on. CrossFit, right? Uh, CrossFit was a strength and conditioning program created by a guy named Greg Glassman in around the 2000s. And the training program is based off of functional movements performed at high intensity. And Greg came up with the theory that fitness, as he understood it, was defined as increased work capacity across broad time and modal domains. What that meant, and he defined work capacity as your ability to do work. For example, if I was gonna ask you to sit up in your chairs and sit down 10 times, that was you know, work capacity. Now, if it took you 10 seconds to do it, if we did it again later on after training, and you were able to do 12 you know, sit-ups from the chair, within 10 seconds, then effectively you would be fitter than what you were the day before. So this idea of constantly varied, which means you, know, you select random movements, or not random, but really a, just a, a, a various you know, large palette of movements to select from. Broad time, distances from one minute out to an hour. Pick brand, uh, different time domains, and then modal domains, different types of uh, uh, terrains and different opportunities to do different things. So. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, this definition is, uh, is one that's both uh, correct in a lot of ways, but also kind of a little broad. Because what it's doing is it's pigeonholed and saying, okay, if you do this amount of work today, and you do this more work tomorrow, then technically you're fitter. But what is that telling us? Is it really preparing us for the task? So CrossFit defines fitness uh, with about 10 different elements and they have different movements and you see people on TV doing the uh, you know, CrossFit games or you go to your local gym. Um, while uh, the, the application might not always be as useful as it could be, um, you can't deny the fact that it's done a ton to get people and get barbells in people's hands and get strength training and also opened up gyms and, sh and put more exposure to this idea of fitness. So really what we've come to the conclusion, or at least I have, is that fitness is personal. 
Fitness has to be defined for each person. And more importantly, fitness needs change over a lifetime. So if you guys are sitting here thinking today, uh, you know, and I want you guys to take a walk back memory lane and think 20, 30 years ago, are you able to do the same things today that you were 30 years ago? And is that okay? No. I mean, it, yes and no. If it's going and digging fence posts with me, I would assume that, you know, you should be able to do those things to be useful. Because if the only thing you can do in your only fitness involves writing a check to ask somebody to do it, then are you really going to be able to prepare if something bad happens? And I always think about fitness as that idea of preparation in terms of, you know, if something bad happens, that storm comes, am I fit enough to survive this? We go back to the biological definition, the idea to, you know, be able to uh, have offspring and be able to live and then, more importantly, see them kind of grow. So how do we know when and how to change our fitness? That's, that's really personal for each person based off of what you can do. And what happens, like I said in that first slide, is that people don't age because, you know, or stop exercising because they age. They age because they stop exercising. It's almost as if the day that you take a day off, the sands of time start coming in. And we start talking about, like, all of a sudden, you're like, wow, I haven't gone out and walked, I haven't gone out and trained, I haven't gone out and played golf, I haven't done the things that I needed to do, and now they're harder for me. And now I can't live my life the same way I used to. That's happened to me. I mean, uh, when I was playing in the NFL, I could run all day and do all this other stuff. Now I have three kids and a full-time job and you travel and the amount of time that I have to train and do what I like to do is greatly diminished. Now, if you were to ask me to go back and play in the NFL, I could probably give you a few good plays, but for the most part, I couldn't take those poundings, but that's okay. I'm okay with that. I was able to do that job. Now I have to change my fitness in terms of my ability to not only, uh, like I said, work on a ranch, raise my kids, uh, hopefully be strong enough and good enough shape to when my daughters come to dating age. And, uh, <laughs> when my son's big enough to take a swing at me one day, be able to put him down. But that's what I'm training for. And I've sat down and made a conscious effort to define what I need to be fit for. And that's kind of a, a, an interesting deal because it's personal to everybody. So my company, like I said, is called Power Athlete. And Power Athlete really grew out of this idea and it was actually come, came from a, uh, uh, an email I got, I started a blog called Talk To Me Johnny years ago where I was getting emails about questions and training. And uh, ironically, I, uh, when I retired from the NFL, I really didn't think anybody wanted to know any of this stuff. That's kind of weird. Like when you play in the NFL, you live in this little bubble. All your friends play in the NFL. Everybody you know plays in the NFL. You hang out with other NFL players. And uh, I just figured that's who we were. I retired and uh, when CrossFit hit me up about bringing my training out and talking to people about training, I started getting all these emails. And I couldn't believe the lack of information that people knew or more importantly, how much bad information there was. And it was everything from, uh, I read this on Facebook, to my mom told me this, which is actually the, uh, the number one recommendation of all supplements and food items usually comes from somebody's Facebook or a friend or a mother. You should take this, I feel great. Oh great, well I wanna feel great, I should take it too. So uh, seeing that, I started this company, Power Ath Athlete, based off of one idea, and it was called Battle the Bullshit. I wanted to be able to provide information to people that was boiled down, disseminated, that didn't have a personal agenda, because a lot of times, and you guys know this, you turn something on, somebody tells you something, and then all of a sudden it's like, and give me $29.95 for this you know, great deal, and I'll sell you this supplement, or here it is, the information. And I didn't want to do that. And I, uh, I didn't want to be cheesy in that way. I want to be able to provide people information that I knew worked in terms of health and performance, longevity, and just really just how to be the best version of yourself. So this started with uh, this general, well, this idea of where we started with fitness and we realized that um, it really wasn't fitness as much as it was athleticism. And the minute that I say the word athleticism, I can see the look on people's faces and instantly you go back to like third grade where you got selected last in kickball. <laughs> and all of a sudden you say to yourself, I wasn't a good athlete. Right, yeah, yeah, somebody else got chosen first, just like she said. Or I, I wasn't as good as I thought, my brother was a better athlete than I, I was. And I'm not talking about athlete, I'm talking about athleticism. And what I, when I went back and realized it, was that nobody had really put a definition together of athleticism that explained it in such a way that made sense to me, and more importantly, helped me understand the components of athleticism. Because if I could define it, I could teach it and make people better athletes or I'm sorry, have more athleticism. 
So the hallmark, and we, we agreed on this, like we could turn on TV, we could see somebody do something, and within a moment of watching them do something, you know if somebody's athletic or not. You watch somebody cross their feet up and trip over two left feet, they fall down and you think, it wasn't very athletic. But you watch people do stuff and it's graceful, simple, easy, effortless. And you think to yourself, wow. It's almost as if this internal uh, coach's eye that's sensing symmetry allows us to see athleticism a lot like we see something that's beautiful, like we all can go out and look at the sunset and think, wow, that's great. And what's amazing is, I don't know about you guys, but every time I see the sunset, I stop and look. And it's never, to me, I've never looked at a sunset and thought, ah, it's just a sunset. And I always try to look at it and thought, man, it looks different every time. And to me, that's athleticism. So what I did, uh, actually on many bar napkins, over a number of years, uh, I would sit down with my guys after we worked or after, or we'd go out to a, teach a seminar or be after work, we'd drink beers. And we would always write down and try to come up with a comprehensive definition of athleticism. So you can tell we're a lot of fun, right? <laughs> uh, so the ability to seamlessly and effortlessly combine primal movement patterns through space to accomplish a known or novel task. Now it just sounds like a lot of words and we'll come back to that in a second because I'm gonna talk to you about how I break this thing down. So the ability to seamlessly and effortlessly, so what does that mean? The ability to transition, to move, to see somebody do something that looks effortless. You know, you can think of like uh, Michael Jackson to Fred Astaire dancing, and you think, and you watch them in, in any of those situations, and you think that has to be movie magic, and you realize they didn't have movie magic back then. There was no CGI. Those guys moved like that. How do they do it? effortlessly combine primal movement patterns. So the term primal movement patterns is one that we have coined in that, and it's not like a, you know, Mark Sisson, caveman, you know, running when I say primal. What I mean primal is I mean the most basic of things. You know, you can think about, um, and I was talking with the guys today at the, uh, the lab, um, you know, for children, and you guys can think back to when you had your kids, or maybe you guys have young kids now, but really you watch uh, a baby and you sit them on the floor, and they, as soon as they can sit up, then all of a sudden they're on their stomach and they push themselves and they start crawling. They start moving their limbs in a unilateral kind of uh, you know, cross patterning and they start to crawl. And as they start to crawl, that is their first movement pattern that they develop. And actually they've done extensive research that have shown that if you do not allow or teach your children or give them the opportunity to crawl, like for example, if you just put them in a runner or put them in a bouncy seat and they don't learn to crawl, they don't develop at the same rate as the kids that do. So an old Russian sports scientist, uh, when I was having kids, I, I got to talk with him pretty extensively about child development, and he said to me one thing, he's like, put baby on floor and ignore it. <laughs> I was like, really? He goes, yeah, just put the kid on the floor and walk away. I said, why? He goes, he'll figure out how to move. And he goes, and when he does, don't, and if he falls down, don't help him, make him push himself back up and watch the movement patterns. He push himself up, they drop into a squat, they push themselves up, they pick up their feet, and all those kind of different patterning. But what do we do? We have a million different things on Amazon that every grandparent wants to buy. The jumper, the this, the runner, all these things, that, and my parents sent me the same crap, and you know what we did? We threw it all away. We didn't provide any of that stuff for them. I provided the opportunity for them to learn and struggle as which probably would have happened many years ago before all this became available to us. The, uh, the other thing he said is the worst thing you can do is carry that child around everywhere. He said, put your child around and ignore them. Let them be self-sufficient. Let them start learning the universe on their own. And that's a, that's a big kind of step for athleticism. So when we talk about primal movement patterns, what I really want to do is break it down into, and I'm going to go forward one because I realize this is out of, out of whack a little bit. Um, I'm going to go into these seven primals, really the lower body primals is where we start. So imagine if I divided your body into an X, Y, and Z axis, like you see on the far right. So the X axis, and the analogy I want to give is, imagine there was a steel spike, and it drove right through my hip and out the other side. And I rotated on that steel spike, right on that X axis. What would, movement would I effectively be doing? What we know as what we call hinging or squatting. So an example of a hinge would be like a kettlebell swing, a squat, a front squat, an overhead squat, a clean, a pull-up, uh, you know, for a kipping pull-up for the CrossFit. Um, any type of movements, and the majority of people do them with what we call hinging. Just a simple thing, sitting down in your chair and standing back up. It's usually done with the feet in a bilateral parallel position, and it's called hinging. It's really our most basic, really, I mean, I'll go into basic primal, it's kind of an oxymoron. 
but uh, really the, uh, or it's redundant rather than oxymoron, but really it's that uh, most simple deal, and we can watch babies do that. They push themselves up into that position and they stand up. Um, the next one being the y-axis. So imagine a steel spike goes through the top of my head, comes out, out through my crotch, and I spin on that y-axis. That is what we effectively known as lunging or stepping. Now the next one, if I put Z through, which is through my pelvis and comes out through my low back, and I spin on that Z axis, then I'm effectively what I'm doing is I'm what's called stepping up or really marching, and we can distinguish this by what we call a, a change of elevation in the iliac crest. So I'll give you guys an example of this so it makes sense. All right, so this position, and maybe I can come down here and do it. So this position, if I'm here, we call this the universal athletic position. Why is that? Because every sport, every athlete, everything starts in this position. If I'm here, what position am I playing? I could be a shortstop, I could be what? I could be a linebacker, I could be tennis, I could be in volleyball. I could be in skiing, I could be in wrestling, I can be in endless. That's the reason it's called the universal athletic position. Because every athletic endeavor starts with this position where you push your butt back, you hinge, slight bend in the knees, toes face forward. That is our basic hip hinge. From that position, imagine if I'm playing linebacker for the Philadelphia Eagles or something. The ball gets snapped and I take a step. So now I've gone from X axis to Y axis. Somebody comes at my knees, I hurdle over them, now I'm in Z axis. I square back up, bend my knees and explode for a tackle, and now I'm in X axis. So the ability to actually translate or, or to really move between X, Y, and Z axis, the ability to seamlessly and effortlessly combine primal movement patterns is what we know as athleticism. That's it. I know it sounds crazy, <laughs> but that is how basic it, our movements patterns are. When you watch somebody move, it's just really a uh, complex language of movement of X, Y, and Z axis when you watch somebody do it. Now sprinting, right? Sprinting is a combination of X and Y, but you know, when you look at running is just a Y. How it all fits basically is going to put us in you know, different athletic endeavors. Now, your ability to demonstrate athleticism is based off of your competency in these primal patterns. So, if we had a training style that just involved hinging, all I did was squat and deadlift, would I become a better athlete? Of course, if somebody that didn't do anything, but could you maximize your athleticism by only training one movement pattern? No, not at all. If we know that the ability to seamlessly and effortlessly combine these primal movement patterns is what we know as athleticism, then we can take a step back and we can start to develop competency in X, Y, and Z axis. So now, when we start talking about training in this model, we can ask, can athleticism be developed? Think about that. My contention is athleticism is a continuum. And where you start with my little dude on the far left, with his hands up, where you start on the athleticism continuum is based off of what? Three things. Genetics, geography, and opportunity. So everybody's gonna start in a different place. Some people are just more gifted than others. Would I, would, if I wasn't 6'6", six, 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 would I have got a chance to play in the NFL? No. Uh, if I was the, I had two older brothers, we're all about the same size. Um, they played college football, they didn't get to play in the NFL. Why is that? Because their little brother was probably tougher than them from taking a lot of ass whoopings. <laughs> right? And I also had the opportunity, when I was young, to get involved in lifting weights and training. And when my brother said, hey, I gotta go out and practice playing football, do you wanna be our dummy? All of a sudden, I got to go out there, and when I got to go to high school, I realized for the first time I got to compete against kids my own age. And I had had this extensive boxing career, which uh, was extremely more, it was really beneficial, because the first day I went out there, I hit this kid square in the face, and I thought I was gonna get yelled at, and the coach high-fived me and gave me the starting job. <laughs> but, so where we start on that continuum is firmly based off of a, bunch of, of a bunch of things that we have no control on. But once we establish what athleticism is in terms of primal patterns, and there's an upper body set of primal patterns, it's a vertical push, 
vertical pull, horizontal push, and horizontal pull. So there's seven patterns. We can effectively start developing more athleticism in all of our participants. And it doesn't matter where you are on the continuum where you start, it just allows us to move this way. And how do we do it? By training for it. By establishing, here's the definition, now I have the opportunity because I have the knowledge, now I have to understand how I need to step, I need to squat, and I have to need how to lunge. And then I need to start working them in different patterns so that when all of a sudden it's called on me and I'm in a situation where, you know, the big storm is coming and I gotta get out of my house and do something, I don't fall and hurt myself because I've effectively prepared for this. Now, what's kind of interesting with fitness, I really believe that fitness to some extent is a cup. You know, there's a probably a high level of fitness that each person can reach at a certain age and probably that cup gets a little smaller with every age. But what's interesting is I think athleticism is an endless continuum. I think that you can never, ever really reach the max of your athletic potential. So how many people in here play golf? How many of you guys are happy with your swing? One person. <laughs> we, we got one. Finally, we found the one. We found the Neo of golf. So should, we found the one. No, why? Be because it's a constant work in motion, right? There's always something to change. The idea that I have this movement pattern that I'm gonna develop over time, that involves what? Some form of bilateral hip hinge, and now we're looking at rotation on a frontal pattern. So there's three planes of motion. What are they? Right, there is our sagittal plane straight ahead, there's our frontal plane, we move this way, and then there's our transverse plane with a rotation. So the ability to do primal patterns in those three planes of motion is really the expression of athleticism. So it doesn't matter if you're golfing. And so what I was out to do when I developed this power athlete methodology was the idea that I wanted to develop a, group, a blueprint that anybody could lay on top of any training style and analyze it from a poem of athleticism. So. Hold on. So now we go back to this one. So now I talk about the ability to seamlessly and effortlessly combine primal movement patterns through space to accomplish a known or novel task. So through space, like we said, uh, sagittal, frontal, and transverse. Accomplish a known or novel task. So what's a known task? Something we know, right? So those are called closed looped environments. So when you go out and play golf, you know exactly how long, what your club is, you know how far it is, and you know how far you can hit the ball within a pretty decent idea, but you know the demands of hitting the ball. Right? So that would be what's known as a closed loop. I can develop that skill. I can go to the hitting range and I can hit that ball. Is there any, at any point, is there somebody, my partner gonna run at me and spear me as I go hit the ball? <laughs> no. But if you had to prepare for that, that would be making golf not only more exciting, but would also <laughs> take it into what we call our open loop environment. <laughs> Football is a game of open loop, right? So we have a set of skills. We go out and we train, but we don't know what's gonna happen as soon as the ball snapped so that I have to be able to take in all this information to be able to make a conscious decision and then go 100 miles an hour. Now, what about a place kicker? A lot like golf. So you have combinations of open and closed loop environments within every sport. Now, gymnastics, purely closed loop. Those girls train six hours a day at some of the highest level and some of the most gifted athletes on the planet are closed loop athletes. Uh, probably the most athletically demanding sport on the planet, pole vault. I got a 20 foot long fiberglass shaft. I'm going to sprint as fast as I can, put it in a hole, probably no bigger than a, a, you know, a, a, a cup on a golf course. And then I'm going to lean back and let it catapult me 20 foot in the air and then try to land and not break my leg. That's by far the most athletic sport on the planet, right? Gymnastics, right? You watch girls on the balance beam. Those are all closed loop environments. They know exactly what's going to happen. Now, the thing is, is, is it, it, can you demonstrate athleticism in a closed loop environment? Of course, right? I mean, would anybody not watch our, our Olympic gymnasts and think those girls aren't incredibly athletic? But here's a question. Is Usain Bolt a great athlete? Fastest man on the planet. When you watch him run, do you think, wow, how athletic was that? Or do you think, man, that dude is fast? Right, so here's, and, and I, I had to do it. I, uh, I watched him and I didn't know he was a great athlete. I watched a YouTube video of him playing soccer. And he was killing people crossing him up, moving, his, his ability to move with the ball was incredible. And I thought to myself, yeah, he's a good athlete. So why is it that I had to watch the fastest man on the planet play a pickup game in soccer to know he was athletic? Because running in a straight line doesn't tell us anything about athleticism, which is 
saginal plane. We know, and we could probably agree, uh, you know, for me, I think probably one of the most exciting athletes to ever watch was Barry Sanders. To watch him move in space and make other people look foolish who were the world's best. To me, when you're able to move in such a way that other people can't even comprehend, then that's what we know as athleticism. So those are known and then novel tasks. So you have to develop your primal patterns to be able to work in not only those closed loop, but those open loop environments. All right, so here's the deal. How do we attack it? So I've given you all this information on fitness. I've talked to you about athleticism. But for you guys and for, you know, really the basis of this talk, which is helping people of it, you know, somewhat advanced or elderly populations continue to train, it's really based off of this idea of how do we help people? And more importantly, how do I make you guys better versions of yourself? It's easy working with a 23-year-old professional athlete, right? They got all the time in the world. They're, they don't have a wife. They don't have kids. They don't have you know, any financial obligations. They just are very selfish in a lot of ways. But as you get older, you have to be, hopefully, you become less selfish. And, and when you become less selfish, you start losing more time. So a big part of this, uh, this talk and what Ken wanted me to task or task me with was the idea of what could I give you guys today? in terms of helping you not only ramp up your athleticism, help with fitness, and get into a, some form of training mode. And a uh, few things happen when we age. Well, the biggest one is we lose mitochondrial density. So mitochondria are, this, are the energy for your cells, and those cells lose density. The other big one is we lose, hyper, or we lose muscle. So that's just happens with the fact with aging, right? So why is it that we lose muscle? Is it a hormonal deal? Is it stress? Is it diet? Is it age? Is it sleep? It's all of these things. And we also lose the ability to recruit motor units. So case in point, how many of you guys, when you go to sit down, do you let yourself just plop in the chair? <laughs> as soon as you like get here, you kind of bend and you go, Ooh, and thank God the chair is there. Because if it wasn't, you would fall right through the floor. How many people here do that? So that is actually one of the first signs of actually losing motor unit recruitment, your ability to control eccentrically your load down to an object. Why is that? Why do we do that? because we stop squatting? Does that become as a side effect? And all of a sudden you think, man, 20 years ago I didn't do that. Am I just getting old? But why is it can I can have a guy like Freddie Camacho at 54, 55 years old still train with these kids at such a high level? Is it the fact that he never, he never took a day off? He never allowed the sands of time to cover him? Yes, but here's the thing, we can fight this stuff back. And your doctor and all these experts and bullshit artists out there that tell you you can't are full of shit. And I know this because we've trained and I've worked with thousands of athletes around the globe and I've seen guys in their 40s and 50s and their 60s and my own dad for very deal come back and start working on understanding how to do these primal patterns and how to put them together and feel like a better version of himself. And to me, I think that's the most important thing we can do. So how do we do it? How do we increase mitochondrial density? So here's a little research article. The best strategy for slow twitch Cytochrome C up, uplifting turned out to be running at about 60 minutes pre-workout at 70 to 75% of their VO2 max, around 80 to 84% of their max heart rate, which hoisted mitochondrial C by approximately 40%. So, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm just using this as an example. The part that I want you to look at is the 70 to 75%, or roughly about, roughly it's about 70 to 75% of your, of your heart rate. So where you find your max heart rate, take 220, subtract your age, and then I want you to take about 70% of that number. And what you have to do, and here's the deal, you don't have to do 60 minutes today. And this is the uh, interesting analogy, and uh, I've used this one for a number of years, and I, it really came from working out on the ranch, is um, you know, training in life is a lot like moving a big pile of dirt. Right, some days you get a shovel, some days you get a spoon, but as long as you move a little dirt each day, you're moving towards your goal. And that's really just kind of been my analogy for training for a number of years. And here's the deal, let's say you get on an exercise bike, just a stationary bike, or even if it's walking. You put on a heart rate monitor, you have an idea like, hey, I gotta get to 110 beats a minute, and I start walking. And what if I don't get there? That's fine, because I'm gonna do this again tomorrow, or I'm gonna find a different day. But eventually what I'm gonna do, and it doesn't matter if it takes me a week, a month, a year, because here's the problem is, uh, if you don't start, you'll never get where you gotta go. You know, the journey of a thousand steps start, or a thousand miles starts with a single step, or my brother always asked me, how you eat an elephant? One, One bite at a time, right? <laughs> so the idea that being able to work up to about 60 minutes at about 70 to 75% of your, base, of your uh, basic heart rate, or of your heart rate, um, your max heart rate, 
is really just, uh, you know, like you said, up to 40% of increasing mitochondrial density. So the idea of building an aerobic base is one of the best things that you can do to prevent aging. Now, what about going longer than 60 minutes? They saw no benefit. So if you could start at 10, if you could start at 20, and if you could work up to the point where, hey, John, I can work for, you know, and if it's even just going out and walking with your friends for 60 minutes, what if I didn't hit my heart rate today? Well, then next week I want to try to push it a little bit. But as long as I'm moving towards my goal, and that's the thing, in our society, everybody wants a quick fix. Can I get this pill? You go to the doctor, I don't feel good, great, I'll give you this pill. Next thing you know, you go to the doctor three times, you end up with 45 pills, and you feel awful. And you're thinking to yourself, you're like, how come every time I come see this guy, I get a pill? What if I didn't see him? I wouldn't get the pills. Because that's what everybody wants. They don't realize the fact that most things take time. I didn't really uh, show up and become an NFL player. It started when I was six years old. And it came down to actually, um, I developed this weird thing about hating to lose. Like, I don't care if it's checkers, one-on-one -on -one basketball, or taking a test. I don't like to lose. And it came from actually playing basketball with my brother. We played one-on-one -on -one basketball every day from the time I was about six or seven years old up until he left for college. And he's about four years older than me. So I was about 14 or 15 when he came back. So for 10 years, we played one-on-one -on -one basketball. I lost every single day. I finally beat him. And we, that was the last day we ever played. <laughs> so that's my ideal. So if we can increase mitochondrial density and this thing called hypertrophy. Now, hypertrophy is kind of a dirty word. I'm sure you guys go to the doctor and they talk about loaning bone density and losing muscle mass, and it's this thing that every doctor is fearful of. But they talk about the boogeyman, but they don't tell you how to combat it. What do they tell you? Lose weight. Yeah, lose weight. So, so think about that. Okay, you, can, you, cannot, <laughs> you can't raise your muscle mass, or you can't increase bone density, or you can't do anything by losing weight. That's all it does is control body fat. What we have to do is we have to do some form of resistance training to drive hypertrophy. Now, when I say resistance, I mean something heavier than what your own body weight is doing. Now, we have up there basic strength training with basic barbell movements, which is what we use. You know, the idea that using basic barbells to challenge posture and position through full range of motion movements for primal patterns is really what we do for our training. You know, anywhere from three to 12 reps, but as long as the progressive overload theory of, for example, if I'm gonna sit up and down in my chair five times, and then tomorrow, instead of sitting up and down five times, I'm gonna hold, I don't know, uh, a cup of coffee, hopefully not burn myself, and I'm gonna sit up in five times, and you start essentially you know, loading on this pattern. We use it as a basic linear progression in barbell training. We start people out with just a, a PVC, and then over time we add a little weight, a little weight, a little weight, and we just keep driving ad, uh, adaptation, kind of similar to what you would hear for the old um, you know, Greek tale of Milo's bowl. You know, when Milo was little, he picked up the calf, and as the calf grew, Milo grew, and then he grew stronger. Same theory with strength training. And surprisingly, that is still the most effective form of strength training, progressive overload. Uh, 60 to 90 seconds rest. So what that means is I'm working at a capacity to drive adaptation using, uh, you know, growth hormone and uh, a bunch of other different hormones that we get as a response to lactic acid. And then there's this other interesting thing called blood flow restricted training. Um, Ken is, uh, has been a big proponent of this and something that we've discussed for a number of years and actually I think it's how we connect it. But the idea, and he has a podcast on it and I'm sure he can talk a little bit more about it, but the idea was created by a guy named Dr. Sato in Japan in the 60s. And they found that actually by reducing venial or venous blood flow, which by putting a cuff or some form of like tourniquet around uh, you know, the distal part in the upper leg or around the bicep, they could effectively reduce blood flow, get the blood to flow in, but not get the blood flow to come out. And it had some really interesting effect. It ramped up growth hormone by about 3,000%. It also uh, blocked myostatin. So your body has a, um, see how I put this in an analogy, almost like a governor on your muscles. So as you train and you, know, you think about muscle growth, your body is constantly limiting muscle growth and it's through this thing that's called myostatin. Well, they found that actually through blood flow restricted training, it was able to block myostatin so there was greater hypertrophy. The interesting thing is it doesn't really matter what weight you use. It just matters that the blood pools. So for example, we could occlude the legs, occlude the biceps and just do basic isometric holds and we use this all the time with our rehab patients that can't, that can't handle any load. And we use it with elderly people that aren't, you know, that might not feel stable or strong lifting weights. We'll use the blood flow restricted training early on to drive adaptation and actually to increase 
cell or a um, venous or a, a vein density. So you think as you age, veins get hard. And why do they get hard? You can say diet, you know, arteriosclerosis. But what they found is that the veins lose, pli uh, they, be they become not pliable anymore. So over time, you have to constantly be driving blood through them. And so that works. Blood flow restricted training, BFR, and there's a system I'll talk about at the end to do that. It's been very, very good for us to, uh, as a way to drive hypertrophy. And then max motor recruitment. So like we talked about, people plopping in their seats. So we talk about priming the central nervous system through accentuated eccentric contractions. What does that mean? That actually means having partner resisted, and we do this quite often with a lot of injured athletes, being able to do accentuated negatives. Obviously there's three muscle contraction. There's a concentric, which is shortening, eccentric, which is lengthening, and then isometric, which is holding. By accentuated negatives, muscle lengthening, we can effectively fatigue neuromuscular pathways and allow people to get stronger and start keeping motor units to fire. Now, we can also lift weights with varying intensities, or we can use uh, some, a little bit of technology that people have been using for roughly the last 80 years. And it's actually a unit right here, and I borrowed Ken's because he has one, but it's called PowerDot. And these are EMS devices, electric muscle stimulation. And what this means is through these units in a cell phone with pads that go on the muscle, everywhere the muscle touches will get 100% motor unit recruitment. So let's say we go out and train. Let's say I go out and train. How many motor units am I using in a workout? I have no concept. I just know whether or not I was able to execute the training or not. So what we'll do is we'll use these with our athletes in a post-workout environment to try to get, clean up anything they might not have used. I started using it with our older athletes as a way to prime the system to get them ready to wake things up, almost like saying like, hey, we're gonna squat, we're gonna do these movements, hey, wake up, and kicking them. And uh, all of a sudden, people that were able to do things or weren't able to do things were able to do things that they hadn't done in a number of years. So basically by using just some very simple, and these aren't expensive. I mean, it's, I mean, geez, they're, I think uh, 150 bucks, which you know, might sound like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, if you use it every day, it's probably not. Um, but even being able to do this stuff, like with my parents, my, parents, my dad just turned 80 a couple weeks ago, um, just being able to hook these things up and get them and start feeling things firing and have him tell me, wow, I, I started you know, getting a weird twitch. When I get out of the car, I feel stronger. I don't feel like I collapse as much. When I'm, you know, when I'm turning the wheel, I don't get fatigued in different things. It was, uh, it was extremely important. So, really the idea and what I wanted to talk about is these takeaways. And actually, that's a picture of uh, Dr. Sato from Katsu, who's in his, he's 78 years old. He's super fit. Uh, and this is what he does, and you can actually research him to his deal on katsuglobal.com. But um, basic barbell strength training, uh, power.hq, or I'm sorry, Power Athlete HQ, which is my website, which there's a ton of information on there. And then the power.ems devices at power.com. And then uh, there's two different um, BFR training systems. Uh, the B Strong one is, is very, very simple. And the other one, the Katsu Global, is way more advanced. Um, you know, so two different opportunities. And then obviously the next one, too, which I don't know how many of you guys use these, but uh, how many people in here use a CPAP? Okay. Um, if you're significant others here, does it sound like Darth Vader and some like weird machine that's like <laughs> <laughs> Well, ResMed came out with a travel one that's very small. It's about this big. And it has a, a one cord that goes into a nose pillow, like they call it a nasal pillow. You close your mouth and it's totally silent. Um, I had a, a couple clients that kept complaining of sleep apnea and they were trying different machines and whatever, and uh, I really like to believe that I can lead from the front, and, I, and if somebody asks me a question, I should figure something out about it. So I talked to my doctor, and I got a rest med, and um, he sent it over, and I'm telling you, it took me about three weeks to, uh, to really get used to sleeping with it, but if I didn't sleep with it, I would wake up tired to the point where if I slept with it, I'd wake up after four hours, and you know, I'd go to bed at, let's say, 11 o'clock at night, wake up at 3 a.m., and wake up and be like, ooh, I feel pretty good. I could go start my day right now. Now, if I were to get up, my wife would scream at me. So I just had to lay there. But um, something like that, and it kind of gave me this idea that um, how many, and, and, I, you know, and I know they have sleep studies and a million different things, but I've read a ton of research on the sleep studies and people in an un, unfamiliar environment will never have a true night of sleep. So most of the sleep studies that are done where you go to a hotel, you check in, are completely flawed. 
for a, street, for a sleep study to be ethical and for a sleep study to truly be uh, you know, something realistic, it has to be done in your own environment. So what I need you guys to do is when you go home tonight, have your significant other, and if they, and I don't know how many of you have had this, you stop breathing or you wake up or this god awful sound. And uh, we, I've had plenty of guys whose wives have videoed them sleeping and they like, will send it to me, I'll be like, you need to show this to the doctor. How come you were able to pass your sleep study but yet this is the environment you're sleeping in every night and having a problem? And everybody that we've turned on to this has made massive uh, increases in not only feeling better, not feeling as tired, and uh, I would deem, and I hate to use the term anti-aging because to me it's usually full of quackery, but I think in terms of just um, uh, bringing your life back, because I mean, as you guys know, um, how many of you guys, maybe you guys don't because we're, I think we're conditioned to forget these things, but remember having young kids. You know, I mean, I, I remember, uh, I have uh, twin daughters that are six years old, and I remember for the first six months, I didn't sleep any more than 15 minutes at any one point. And I remember laughing about, uh, I got gray hair. And I was my, so I tell the kids all the time, like, I didn't have gray hair before I met you guys. And, uh, but that's part of being a parent. Um, last part is creatine monohydrate. Now, uh, I don't really, I'm not big on supplements, so I don't recommend them without getting extensive blood testing, but I firmly believe that every person on the planet should be taking at least five grams of creatine monohydrate a day. That's the most basic one. What happened in the supplement industry in about 1990, they came out with creatine, and companies couldn't make money on it because it wasn't expensive enough to make. So they started making a million different versions, and actually the most basic one, creatine monohydrate, is by far the most beneficial. Uh, creatine ramps up ATP, which helps with mitochondrial density, helps with cellular function in the brain, and is actually the best thing that you can do to effectively combat any form of cognitive issues. Uh, I'm probably the longest continuous creatine user on the planet. I started in 1990, and I have no problems. So a lot of the ideas where people were having, you know, liver, kidney, dehydration, all the other stuff, I think is, um, is total uh, witch hunting and bullshit. So um, I think everybody on the planet at some point should be taking it. Now, where does creatine come from? It's actually in all vertebra, uh, some form of, uh, you know, some form of meat, um, you know, in dosages, but the ability to be able to take just five, you know, five grams, which is just a small teaspoon every day, I think is uh, extremely important in terms of continuing muscle mass, mitochondrial density, ATP, fighting off aging is probably the best thing you guys can do. So, all right. I. Uh, Pretty close hit it, so um, I'll open it up to questions. Yes? Thank you for explaining your question. Okay, you mentioned, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, muscle atrophy, and you, you, you didn't use the word sarcopenia, and, uh, we, and you mentioned a lot about misinformation. And one of the things uh, clinicians have been taught for years is that for adults, for every five years of aging, you use X percentage points of muscle mass. And a couple of years ago, a Ohio university said they debunked that with your points in the exercise and training would uh, made that untrue and you could really minimize entropy, uh, sarcopenia, muscle mass loss with exercise. Do you remember the Ohio university or the name of that uh, particular test? No, I, um, I can't off a of hand, but I mean, I've pretty, uh, I've seen enough. Um, the the NFL is an interesting deal. It's almost like a, a fast forward microcosm in a lot of ways. Um, guys either fall into two camps. They, when they get done playing, they either stop training altogether or they continue to train and almost like, hey, this is what I've done my whole life. The difference five years after compared to the guys that continue to train versus the guys that don't is night and day difference. And the analogy I give, it's almost like the wheels fall off the bus. And so the analogy and what I really talk about is, is I'm fighting to keep those wheels on. I'm constantly tightening those lug nuts. The reason that I have a gym at my house and we train every morning and I, I all the guys that work for me, we, uh, their health plan is actually the gym and they have to show up every day. And uh, they get docked if they don't show up or they give me some bullshit excuse. But a part of that becomes is that you have to constantly be fighting the sands of time. And I think the problem is, is uh, modern medicine, um, I think really lost its way in a lot of ways. Because what have they done? When you go to the doctor, they either give you a shot, they give you a pill, or they give you a surgery. Yeah. Right? So then it's like, you know, what, what are my options? You know, because they know, um, you know, if I lose weight, will I get healthier? If I exercise, if I do all these things. But they know that people won't do it. So what do they do? They give you the easy way out. 
It's like we were talking about, um, you know, um, I work with some people that have diabetes, and the analogy that they give is, hey, don't worry about it, continue to eat the same way, just take the insulin. Even though they know that diabetes is a disease of carbohydrates. So if I don't eat the carbs, do I need the insulin? No. But nobody's gonna not eat the carbs. And why is that? Maybe because it's a lot of our, uh, just how we've been raised. I mean, you think about, there isn't a single holiday on this planet that isn't associated around food, <laughs> right? I did great at work, I'm gonna go out and get some deep. You go over to somebody's house if they don't have snacks out, like you look at them like they must not like us, <laughs> right? It just, it just works that way. So we really looked in terms of food as this, uh, you, know, um, you know, like not necessarily what it should be. For me, uh, you know, honestly, I could care less what I ate. I just wanted to ramp up performance. Um, and I was telling Doc the funny story about um, growing up, my dad always told us you gotta have a big bowl of heart healthy grains. So we'd have this big bowl of cereal and of course you gotta have the you know, low fat milk is, you know, normal fat will kill you. And uh, <laughs> as soon as I would eat, I would get sick. And then I would go to school and I'd sleep through my first period. And my dad got a note that, um, you know, John needs to go to sleep, long, uh, sleep more. And I'm like, dad, I wake up, I feel great. And uh, I don't feel this way on the weekends. And my dad was like, ah, you're just being dramatic. So I uh, come to find out, well, the reason was every morning for school, we got up and we had to have this god awful bowl of grape nuts or whatever we had. And then on Saturdays, what did we have? We had bacon and eggs. You know, because bacon was only on the weekends because, you know, you can't eat that stuff every, you know, uh, every day because one, you can't afford it. And two, uh, it'll kill you, right? And so we got to eat that on the weekends. Felt great, got to go out and play. I'm like, Dad, I don't understand. I feel great on Saturday and Sunday, but Monday through Friday, I feel awful. Why? And it wasn't until I got older that I you know, realized through some blood testing that I had some you know, gluten allergies and that I was allergic to certain things and I didn't process carbohydrates the same way that other people did. So what did I do? I just kind of naturally ramped it back. And there's some inherent periodization for diet. This is my favorite one. I ate this way when I was 18 and now that I'm 50, I don't feel this good and I have gaining weight. Why can't I eat the same way at 18? And I'm like, my analogy is, okay, what about alcohol? When I was 18 and 20 years old, I could drink <laughs> like every drink at the bar and wake up, go train and feel like a million bucks. You give me two drinks now and I'll wake up like somebody put a nail through my forehead. <laughs> so wouldn't that be that I'm not able to process alcohol sugar the same way as I age? Wouldn't that make sense in terms of just consuming carbohydrates? Hey, we just can't process them the same way. So there is some natural inherent periodization with diet as you age. Right? And, I, and like, as soon as I explain it to people like that, they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And I'm like, okay, good. Is that answered? I'm sorry. I, I, I can look it up for you, but... Um, okay, one more. Yeah, over there in the back. Uh, thank you, John. There used to be a show, uh, you're a little younger, but it was Sanford and Son. And Fred Sanford, he'd walk like this. I'd always laugh at him. And now, despite, you know, doing lunges and all the stuff she makes me do, the elliptical this morning and the planks and the squats, I'm walking like this. And, you know, as we get it, as we age, I mean, a lot of people, you see them kind of hobbling around. And do you have specific exercises or anything like that? Before you answer that, I also want to say your brother used to beat me up, too. Your brother, Rob. But, but he would never beat me up in the same way he beat you up. He would beat me up with martinis at the bar, as he used to call on us here. So anyway, tell him Tim Kruger said hello. I will. Uh, I, I, well, long, long story short, I, I used to live in Tampa, Florida, lived in Clearwater. My brother actually worked here in Florida, and he worked up here. So I've been here before, but I'll, I'll tell him you said hello. Uh, so two things. One, um, people learn movement patterns through watching. And uh, there was an interesting study, and I can't, I, I would have to pull it up and look at it, but they did uh, some observation of children that were raised by their paternal grandparents. And they showed their gait and how they walked. And I remember one of the kids, the one that stuck with me the most, um, the father walked with a cane, or the grandfather, and then when they watched, watched the kid, and I remember seeing him walk, he kind of walked with the same kind of shuffle that the grandfather had. So, the analogy I give too, and this is a kind of a funny story you guys can all relate to, is, um, I got, like I said, three kids. My daughters are sitting in the middle seat. We're driving, and I tend to drive fast. And this guy cuts me off, and I remember I like leaned back, and I was like, "Fuck!" <laughs> so my wife, of course, looks at me, and I can feel her like gaze looking at me, and I'm like, "Okay." So about a week later, we're driving in the car, and somebody cuts me off again. And before I even get done and can say it, I look back and I hear my daughter go, "Fuck!" <laughs> which, at which point, I can feel the laser beam gaze. 
of my wife turn on me. And it goes back as children learn by watching, but we all do. So we're constantly in this kind of evolution of like watching movement patterns. And so the, the thing which I really talk about is uh, how do I improve my movement? Well, one, like we talked about breaking down primal patterns, but also watching yourself move. So I think probably the most real thing that your wife could do for you is videotape you hobbling around like an old man like Fred Sanford <laughs> and show it to you. And then what you need to do is you need to slow it down and you need to have her video it until it looks like how you should move. Because here's the thing, we get stuck in weird movement patterns that we don't even realize we get stuck into. And nobody says it to us, why? We're getting old, right? And then this, this happens all the time. It's why when we go to the gym, um, we have a, a full length mirror that we move around at different positions. And whenever I observe something strange, I put the mirror on, I'm like, oh, go move in the mirror, let's do it again. And all of a sudden you'll watch people do all these weird things. I'm like, do I do that all the time? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, I, I would have never known because we just fall within these kind of movement patterns. So I think a big thing for us, and I know you guys, this has happened to everybody, all of a sudden you see a picture or a video or something, you think, oh shit, I need to lose some weight. <laughs> Do I really look that old? Oh my God, that looks awful. And that self-realization, how did this happen? And the reason being is people let us slide. And I think um, everybody needs to have some form of like that turn back on them and understand like, hey, this is what I need to do. Everybody knows what it should look like. So I think for her, she has to show you because her telling you, you're like, oh, I'm fine. Be like, you're not fine. Here it is. Here's the video of truth. I'm going to show it to you every day. So is that good? Ken, uh, one more. We're good. Okay. One more. Yeah. In, in the yellow. Football questions. Uh, what was your position? Uh, I played left guard uh, for the Philadelphia Eagles. And then I played right tackle for the Kansas City Chiefs. Played right guard for the Kansas City Chiefs when Will Shields retired, and then I played right guard and right tackle for the, uh, for the Patriots. Did you say that you uh, were in the martial arts also? Yeah, so when I was six years old, we got into Shotokan and uh, did martial arts, and then I, I um, didn't want to kick anymore. I thought it was kind of dumb. So how did, how did that, um, did, you, did that give you an edge, martial arts and boxing, give you an edge in, uh, in the NFL and how so? 100%. Uh, I believe that actually my fight training as, an, as a kid was probably the single most beneficial thing for me playing for a decade in the NFL. So when I, um, you know, countless hours on the speed bag, focus mitts, the ability to cut a guy off on the ring and how to play a guy two thirds inside out and how to get angles and how to move and never give people square people up, how to bend my knees and move in space, meaningful touches, how to close distance. I learned all that in the boxing ring. I learned all that in fighting. So when I got to the NFL, or more importantly, when I was in high school, all of a sudden I was playing against guys that didn't know how to fight. When I got to the NFL, all of a sudden I was playing against big guys that didn't know how to use their hands and didn't understand the idea of the first meaningful touch and how to close distance. And uh, that for me, the ability to close distance and um, the scouting report on me for a number of years, fast hands. Don't let his hands get on you. He moves his hands faster. And so guys always ask me, how'd you move your hands? I'm like, uh, you, you got to go back in time, 15 years. And the countless hours we did on the speed bag and the focus mitts and the heavy bag and how to move and how to be able to absorb those blows. And uh, for me, that was a skill that I developed. But I had a number of friends, same thing, Tony Gonzalez, best tight end to ever play the game, 17 years. What did he do? Played basketball. Just so happens that there was more success for a six foot four tight end in the NFL, in, in the NFL than there was for a six foot four power forward. And Tony said it was just like playing basketball against a bunch of dudes that didn't know how to play basketball. <laughs> so that was my NFL career. Thank you. Thank you.